Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome again to uh, Nanoet Tech here at Georgia Tech, uh, the Institute for Electronics and Nanotechnology. Before I introduce uh, today's speaker, just a quick word about our next seminar, which will be in on March 8th. I guess that's two weeks from today. Uh, and we'll be over in the Pettit building. Uh, at least that's the plan, uh, unless this room becomes available again. Um, and the speaker will be uh, Professor Jin Ji from the uh, Department of Chemistry at UGA. Uh, so it's a real pleasure to have with us today uh, a, a, a new person at Georgia Tech, uh, Professor Lauren Garten. Uh, Lauren got her bachelor's degree in ceramic engineering at the University of Missouri uh, before getting her PhD in uh, material science and engineering at Penn State and then postdocing at the National Renewable Energy Lab uh, and then acting as a staff scientist at both Sandia and the Naval Research Lab where she was a um, Carl Fellowship under a Carl Fellowship and a National Research Council Fellowship uh, before coming to Georgia Tech just last year. So welcome Lauren and we look forward to what you have to say. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lauren Garten, and I am very grateful to have the opportunity to present today. Um, as was mentioned, I started here last August, and I have not had very many opportunities to meet people outside of my department, so um, I consider this a really good opportunity to do so. I am uh, very interested in collaborating. I love to talk science, so if you're uh, if you're interested, feel free to reach out at my email here. Okay. Um, so today I'm going to share some of our work on the impact of strain on magnetoelectric coupling in artificial multiferroic heterostructures. I'd like to start by acknowledging uh, my great collaborators, my mentors, and my students. Um, who helped with this work. As was mentioned, this was supported by the Jerome and Isabel Carls Fellowship from the Naval Research Lab. Now, both of them were amazing crystallographers, one of which won the Nobel Prize, so I'm very honored to, to have that award. Um, this is also funded by ONR61 and my Georgia Tech startup. Okay, so here's a brief overview of my talk. I'm going to begin by breaking down the definitions of all of the words that I used in the title of my talk, right? <laughs> Just so that we can have some context on magnetoelectric coupling. Um, then I'm going to go into the experimental development, what we are, are working with, how we put it together, and then finally talk about our results in converse magnetoelectric coupling as a function of strain. Okay, so if you can harken back to the last time that you took crystal chemistry or crystallography, and you remember the talks about all of the different point groups that you could have, you'll remember that there are 32, 21 of which are non-centrosymmetric. So that, um, what does that mean? Now, if you have a material that, if you have a material that's centrosymmetric, it means that when you look at the unit cell, and you stare at the center, there should be an atom that is equal and opposite for every atom in that unit cell, for it to have a center of symmetry to be a centrosymmetric crystal structure. Now, if we look at the sample on the right, ooh, sorry, if we look at the material on the right, you can see that because of the uh, displacement of this cation, you no longer have this center of symmetry, right? And suddenly, the center of positive and negative charge in your sample are offset, and you have this internal dipole. So um, when we're talking about non-centrosymmetric crystal structures, um, this, is what, uh, this is something to keep in mind. So of the 21 non-centrosymmetric crystal structures, or, or I should say point groups, these are not specific materials or specific crystal structures, they're point groups, um, 20 of which can be piezoelectric, which I'll describe here in a second. Um, 10 of those are intrinsically polar, right? So they have this dipole already present within the structure itself. A very small subset of those are ferroelectric. An even smaller subset of those are multiferroic. And an even smaller subset of those are magnetoelectric, right? So it's important that we understand all of these different terminologies and properties 
to understand how magnetoelectric coupling can occur. And also, when searching for new magnetoelectric materials, there's a lot that we have to go through to find, hopefully, more of these um, single-phase magnetoelectric materials. Uh, so let's start with piezoelectrics and work our way down, right? So I like to begin talking through applications, just so we have some context on why we care about this particular material property. So piezoelectric materials enable a number of different technologies. It is not a common word in our vernacular, but it's actually pretty ubiquitous in our lives. So these are things like sonar transducers, medical ultrasounds, sensors, capacitors, uh, actuators, accelerometers, and, and now also adaptive optics. So there's a lot of different applications that piezoelectrics can impact our lives and a lot of different reasons to be interested in these materials. So what is piezoelectricity? So in this case, piezoelectricity is a polarization, polarization that is induced by an applied stress or vice versa, right? A linear strain that is induced by an applied electric field. And as a material scientist, I like to think through a, a physical representation of this. If I had this tetrahedra here as my piezoelectric material, and I were to apply a stress to the apex of this tetrahedra, what happens is that rather than shortening the bond length for all of the legs, you actually see that the base of the tetrahedra splays outwards. This then creates that difference in the center of positive and negative charge which is the um, polarization induced by stress, which is your piezoelectric effect, right? Um, and in a macroscopic sense, we can see this as when we apply a, a voltage to these materials, we'll see a change in shape. You will not see it because it's usually very small, um, but that's, that's how we're using these and vice versa. If you apply a stress to these, you will uh, measure an, um, a voltage. So my background and my specialty is in uh, piezoelectrics and ferroelectric materials. I've worked uh, a lot on discovering new piezoelectric materials um, because it's very difficult to determine if something's going to be ferroelectric or multiferroic. It's very difficult to predict that. So we start searching first with piezoelectric materials, right? So this is work that was done in collaboration with the Materials Project. They came up with a list of interesting potentially high piezoelectric response materials, right? And that's what's shown here on this graph. There's just a dot for each one, radially showing its EIJ piezoelectric coefficient. Now, there's a reason why these things have not been done before, right? That this was a list that they came up with of new compounds. And that's because almost every one of these is either metastable or toxic or highly volatile, radioactive, you know, just you know, they're, they're computationalists, right? So, um, but in this case, we, we went through this list and we found a couple that we could make. So um, we stabilized three compounds so far, um, strontium hafnate, manganese selenide, and barium nicolate. Uh, the first two we've shown are piezoelectric and the last we're still working on. Um, so here are the, some of the results for that. So again, I'd like to, to just stress that we're interested in the discovery of new piezoelectric materials, and if you have something that's difficult to grow or a growth challenge, I'd, I'd be curious to see how we could help with that. Um, a little bit more about future piezo piezoelectric work that's going on in Georgia Tech. So uh, we'll be using some of these piezoelectric compounds to understand how the piezoelectric potential that develops can impact ionic migration as part of understanding piezocatalytic behavior. So that's supported by an ONR YIP. I also want to point to two other really good groups. So Nazan Ambassiri Garb's group um, here on campus as well. Uh, they're experts in piezo response force microscopy and using machine learning on those types of analysis to understand the piezoelectric and ferroelectric response of materials for smart sensors. Likewise, there's Azda Anasari's group who is using a lot of these piezoelectric materials in RF filters and MEMS. So um, I'd encourage, I'm sure there's a lot of other people who are using piezoelectric materials, and I'm sorry if I missed you. I'd love to meet you. Um, but if you have piezoelectric questions, please feel free to, to reach out to one of these groups. OK, so now we are hopefully all experts in piezoelectricity. You know, we could give that quiz and we'd all pass. Um, now let's move on and make it a little bit more complicated. So I'm going to start uh, in on what are the ferroelectric criteria. So the first is the spontaneous polarization. You remember when we were talking about before, when we have this internal dipole in our material, um, this is what we're referring to as our spontaneous polarization. 
um, it occurs naturally and it creates this dipole. Now the thing that's really unique about ferroelectrics is that if you apply an electric field in the opposite direction, you can actually change the crystal structure. You can switch the direction of your dipole. You'll take this titania that you have here and instead of bonding to the top oxygen, you can drive it towards it bonds towards the bottom oxygen. So it's, a, it's an elect uh, electric field induced crystal structure change, um, which is pretty fascinating and, and rare. Um, and uh, again, once the material is pulled and all of your dipoles are oriented along the uh, uh, direction so that you have a macroscopic symmetry breaking, they'll also be piezoelectric. So everything that's ferroelectric is also piezoelectric, right? Um, the final thing that I want to stress, because this is going to come up again, is the idea of domains. So the material, the polarization in each unit cell has choices as to which direction it can point. And it will pick those dependent on the local electric and electric boundary conditions. So you get different regions within the same material that choose, I shouldn't anthropomorphize, but they, in a sense they choose to point along different directions. And this creates domains. These are regions of oriented polarization. As we take some of our measurements, as we're applying an electric field, what is happening is we are driving these domains so that with increasing applied electric field, they all start to orient. And then as we remove our electric field, we actually see that the preponderance of the polarization maintains oriented. So now you have something that has a maintained fixed dipole that was not present previously. And again, you can cycle this whole system uh, pulling in one direction, pulling in another direction. You can, in a sense, kind of do uh, design of these domain orientations. Okay. So again, I, I kind of wanted to do a little capture of some of the ferroelectric work that's going on in Georgia Tech, just for perspective, um, just, just to share. So our work is work, our group, my group, is working on the growth and characterization of 2G monochalcogenides as a platform to study how piezoelectricity can impact things like the charge transport and optoelectronic properties. So in this case, we're looking at materials um, and the growth challenge. I always like to find a growth challenge, you know, here is that these materials are only piezoelectric or ferroelectric in odd numbers of layers near the monolayer limit, right? So in one layer, the dipole goes this way, in one layer, the dipole goes this way. When you have two layers, it's not polar. When you have one layer, it is. Right, so, so we've already started growing that, um, and that work's gonna be supported by an AFOSR, yep. Uh, another group I'd like to point to, if you haven't met them already, and I encourage you to go over there, is the Seif Khan's group. They're doing a lot with the deposition of ferroelectric thin films, and in this case, they're looking at CMOS-compatible ferroelectric field effect transistors, right? So this is kind of a, a new and recent push in ferroelectric materials. You can imagine they are ideally suited for this type of technology where you can have two discrete fixed states that you can modulate through a field, right? So, so again, I'm sure there's a lot of other people who are working in ferroelectricity. Um, I'd love to meet you. And uh, I'd say if you have questions about ferroelectricity, this is probably the place to go. Okay, right? So we're, we're building this up in complexity. We've gone through piezoelectrics. We've gone through ferroelectrics. Now we're gonna go through multiferrox. And um, as the name suggests, I mean, this is a multiferroic, right? So this is a material that has multiple ferroics. And the question is, okay, well, what's a ferroic? In this case, um, it's any material where it has a property that the application of a driving force can modulate between two particular states that has a particular symmetry. So I should add that in there. Um, and for something to be multiferroic, it must exhibit at least two of these simultaneously. So in ferroelectrics, like I showed, uh, this driving force is an electric field and the response is polarization. In a ferromagnet, it would be a magnetic field and a magnetization, right? Um, there's a lot of different types of ferroic properties. There's ferroelastics, ferrobioelastic, ferromagnetoelectric. Um, the, the, the one thing I should add is it does not have to have iron in it to be a ferroic, right? That is an unfortunate historical naming convention that is just stuck because people discovered ferromagnetism in iron, right? So most of the things we work with actually don't have uh, iron in them, but do have at least two types of ferroic properties. Um, 
with the exception of this material. So this is the one iron-based compound that we're working on. So my group is looking at the stabilization of scandium ferrite. In this case, it's again a metastable compound, something that should not form at room temperature and pressure. Um, but we are looking at ways where we can actually stabilize this. Um, we're particularly interested in this P6 sub 3 CM phase, which um, you can see in the TEM. The, the polarization is actually clearly visible. You have the one up, two down, one up, two down, one up, two down. So you can actually see the polarization distortion in the TEM, which I think is really cool. Um, in this case, what we found is that if we deposited this in discrete layers of iron oxide and scandium oxide, as compared to a, a continuous deposition of both, we were able to stabilize this metastable compound, right? So for the same conditions, the same temperature, the same pressure, the same deposition rate, the same substrate, when we deposited iron and scandium simultaneously, we got the ground state, right? And uh, we turned to some of our theory colleagues recently who helped us understand a little bit more of this, and it's just this idea that um, each one of the layers as it's deposited is stable, right? As, as an entire structure, it might not be stable, but the scandium oxide layer is, right? So you get to a point where you start doing this deposition where all of these kind of precursor layers are stable independently. And because you have variability in the oxidation state of your iron, you can actually accommodate this, right? And so you get to a point where you've accidentally, kind of, not accidentally, we did it purposely, but, but, uh, but as far as the material thinks, it's, it's accidentally formed itself into this, um, this metastable compound. And the energy that it would take to relax is, is, um, is, is too great and it's inhibited from relaxing back into the ground state. So um, it's really fascinating and really interesting way to, to stabilize materials. So, um, so that's a snapshot of some of our multi ferroic work. I will say this material it has a relatively high nail temperature, but it's still not above room temperature. And we are actually not using it for its magnetic properties because it does not have great coupling. But it is interesting for a lot of other optoelectronic work. So. Okay, <laughs> finally, right, it's, it's a long introduction, but finally we've gotten to the point where we're talking about magnetoelectrics, right? And one of the things that I, again, wanted to stress is that there are a lot of potential and a few realized applications for magnetoelectric materials. It can be an energy harvester. It can be a sensor for either magnetic or electric fields. It could have this as a, a, a resonator. Um, there's often certain types of these structures that are used in memory. But I think one of the most interesting or fascinating upcoming uh, uh, applications for this is a certain type of logic called MEOS. Um, and this is a paper from the Berkeley group um, where they predict that this should take less than added joules to switch, which is just crazy. <laughs> you know, so, so, so in this case, by reducing the amount of energy it takes per switch, and having such a ubiquitous device, you can do a lot as far as energy saving goes. So I think there's a lot of interesting potential here. A lot of this has not really, really been developed, certainly not commercialized, but my hope is that in the future, there'll be a lot of magnetoelectric technologies. Okay, so what is the magnetoelectric effect? And this one, hopefully, is pretty clear. Um, magnetoelectric coupling occurs in materials um, and this is the definition that I found. So I'll start with this. Um, it occurs in materials where the magnetization can be induced by applying an electric field or vice versa. Um, polarization can be induced by applying a magnetic field. I would like to add to this definition that um, you don't necessarily have to induce a polarization or magnetization. It can already be present. I feel like anything that has coupling between an electrical and magnetic response could be a viable magnetoelectric, right? Um, and for now, we're just going to look at, at kind of this first term in the equation and looking at the coupling um, for both the converse and direct effect. Now, <laughs> so talk about materials challenges, right? Um, there are very few materials that are simultaneously ferroelectric and ferromagnetic. Um, you do not have to, ha have to be a ferroelectric and ferromagnetic to be magnetoelectric. There are another small, strange group of materials that have other mechanisms of coupling, but I like to use this as an example just to give perspective on why these two things are rarely concurrent. So for a ferroelectric, we need to apply an electric field. So you want it to be as insulating as possible, ideally, right? So that you can switch your polarization. In a magnetic material, you want to have some type of unpaired spin, right? 
And typically that has been done in metals. Right, so metals are very conductive and not conducive to ferroelectricity. So, so we've, we're finding ways around this, right? In scandium ferrite, you have the, the polar distortions happening on the scandium, the magnetism's coming from the iron, so there are ways around this. But overall, there's not very many uh, materials that do this. To the best of my knowledge, there's one, maybe two materials that at room temperature are both ferroelectric anti-ferromagnet, um, but there are not yet to my understanding, a ferroelectric ferromagnet material. And if there is, I would love to know about it. So, um, so this is just one of the challenges that we face, right, in this case. Um, and the other thing that I'll say is, in addition to being rare at room temperature, the uh, coupling is actually pretty weak. So if you look at the terbium manganate, the response is significantly lower than the coupling that we see in other types of composite materials, right? So. That leads me to my next point, which is this idea of artificial multiferroics. So as a community, because there are not a lot of materials that fulfill this type of coupling need, they've collectively moved to artificial structures. In this case, usually the, the ferro or the, the magnetic and the electrical response are decoupled. Um, one material takes care of one portion and the other takes care of another, and they interact across an interface, right? Um, and there's a lot of different architectures that you can do this in. We are gonna focus today on a 2-2 architecture, so a continuous plane on a continuous plane. Um, and, and like I showed before, the coupling coefficient of these are orders of magnitude greater than what we would see in a single phase, right? So, um, so there's a lot of interest in, and these artificial heterostructures actually dominate a lot of the magnetoelectric applications that are out there or are being developed. Okay. So there's a, a little bit more insight to gain. This is important. So in magnetoelectric coupling, there's a couple of different mechanisms that you can use. Um, you can do charge across an interface. You can do exchange bias across an interface. Or you can do strain. So this is what we're going to focus on today. And strain-mediated magnetoelectric coupling is the highest response or is, is one of the best routes to achieve a high CME response. So this is what we're going to focus on. Instead of going from, magne uh, from your magnetic field straight to your polarization, in this case, we, we go through uh, magnetostriction and then piezoelectricity, right? So um, what we're working on here is the converse magnetoelectric effect. So in this case, we take our piezoelectrics, which we talked about before, right, where the application of an electric field causes a strain. We put on top of it a magnetostrictive material, right? so that strain can couple across the interface into our magnetostrictive material. Then that material, because it's magnetostrictive, the change in shape that it sees due to the strain at the interface leads to a change in the magnetization. So that's the converse magnetoelectric coupling effect. Okay, so um, here, the, the, now that we've separated the two components, the ideal route moving forward to increase your CME is to increase either the piezoelectric response of your piezoelectric material or the magnetostriction of each of your individual components, right? Um, so the question is, how can we do this? So now I'm going to go into some of the experimental setup for what we were using for our particular material systems. The first is uh, layer breaking in our magnetic layers and piezoelectric phase transitions. So. Um, this is something that was discovered a fair while back, and it's this idea that uh, rather than using a continuous layer, if you have periodic layers of non-magnetic material um, interspersed in, in your magnetic medium, you can actually um, have benefits to your magnetostriction. Um, so what we're looking at here is using iron cobalt. I know, <laughs> I know this is something I fully expect. Iron cobalt is not the best magnetostrictive material. I think there's, there's a lot better. There's the uh, terphenol D, which is terbium iron naval ordnance laboratory dysprosium, which is the weirdest chemical formula I've ever come across in my life. Um, but you know, there's this, there's galphenol, there's matte glass, there's a number of other alloys that have uh, better, um, better magnetostriction. In this case, our, our choice was kind of balancing the high saturation magnetization, the high permeability, um, acceptable levels of, of magnetostriction, and the fact that this is something that we had readily processed um, and, and had a number of protocols already developed for this particular material set. So 
It's a pragmatic choice on some level. And in this case, we're comparing the continuous layer um, here to a layer with interspersed silver. Um, and when we look at the um, magnetization magnetic field loops, we can see that with the addition of the interspersed layers, you actually have a significant decrease in your coercive field, which is this, this point here versus this point here. Um, and, um, and the same with your, magneti uh, your, your piezomagnetism, which is shown down here. Um, and this is consistent with what's been seen before. It's a, it's a really good approach to um, really reducing the amount of field that you need to switch, reducing your hysteretic losses, reducing the amount of field that would be necessary to uh, bias a device moving forward, right? If your largest change is gonna be near your course of field, you'd wanna be closer to it. So the more that we can push that back, the smaller kind of bias we need to get to that level of switching. Um, yeah, so, the, so that's, the, that's the magnetic layer. So we can certainly do better with the magnetic layer and I hope to in the future. Um, the piezoelectric material. Now the first one is, let's pick a piezoelectric material with a large response. This is not deep advice, right? This is not complicated, but this is where we started with this, right? So we first look to relaxer ferroelectrics. And relaxer ferroelectrics are a very particular type of ferroelectric material that has a very, very large piezoelectric response. So in this case, what we're looking for is for a given applied electric field, we want to get the most strain out as possible. So these are um, a couple of other piezoelectric materials that you might have heard of, and, and um, this relaxer, uh, which I'll talk more about the composition in a second, actually does significantly better. Um, it's again in this perovskite crystal structure where lead is on your corners, oxygen is at all of your face centers, and literally everything else is at the center B site cation. They just threw the kitchen sink at these things until they found what was optimized. Um, and just for perspective here, I also like to add this plot. So this is the plot of piezoelectric coefficient as a function of temperature for materials that you might have heard of. So um, well, you might have heard of all these, but, but barium titanate, potassium niobate, lead zirconium titanate, right? And as it stands right now, the material that we're using has a piezoelectric coefficient somewhere up here. And the highest, which just came out last year, is somewhere up here. So these materials are doing much better than your standard PZT, which is the baseline that, that just about everybody in devices uses. Cool. So this particular compound that we're using is a lead indium niobate, lead magnesium niobate, lead titanate, or PIN, PMMPT for short. Um, this has been optimized for a number of different reasons, which I'll go into here in a second. Um, the first is that it has intrinsically a very high piezoelectric coefficient. But the second part is that it's actually near a number of different phase boundaries, right? So we can see here that there's a morphotropic phase boundary between the tetragonal and rhombohedral phase in all of these different components. And that impacts um, also the, the uh, temperature, uh, the transition temperature that we have, the composition does. So, so by tailoring both of these, we can get closer to our phase transition. Now, most of the time, people don't wanna do that, right? You don't wanna go through a, a large unexpected phase transition, but in this case, we actually want to use this. So this is a, a plot as a function of temperature, stress, and electric field of the stability surface for this particular type of crystal um, going between the rhombohedral and orthorhombic phase. Now, what happens when you do this is that there is a large strain that occurs on going through this transition, right? And what you get is an effectively magnified piezoelectric coefficient. So for a small amount of electric field, not only are you doing the normal piezoelectric response, you're also driving it through a phase transition, right? Um, and so in this case, it's something that's repeatable, it's cyclable, and we want to use this strain um, in our devices. So for a little bit more perspective on this, you'll remember when I was talking about domains. So domains can be oriented in, in different directions depending on the crystallography of the material that you're using. So in this case, in our rhombohedral sample, we cut it and pull it so that there are only two options, right, up or down. And then as we apply a stress to this material, you get to a point where they collapse, right? So that is what is inducing this very large change that you see um, in the amount of strain that's present. So you're going between this, these mono, uh, the poly domain to a mono domain state. Um, and so the idea here 
sorry about that. The, the idea here is that um, if we can poise the sample near, the, near this phase transition, so if we, if we put it, say, here or here, then using a small bit of electric field, we can have a large increase in our strain, right? So we're adding another kind of extrinsic component to the strain that we have using a piezoelectric, piezoelectric phase transition. So we did this. We went back and used these uh, non-commensurate layer breaking films, uh, the magnetic films, and we deposited these on top of a uh, 011 polled PIM, PIM, MPT single crystal. And we tried to drive this, or, or the group tried to drive this towards that phase transition, right? And what they found is that with stress, actually the uh, converse magnetoelectric response, which I'll talk about how that's calculated in a bit, um, actually decreased significantly, right? So um, this is one of those cases where you have a hypothesis and it doesn't work, right? I, th I think it's important to share that too. Um, so, so clearly there's something else going on, like the, the pinning um, or other interactions come to dominate over what we would expect we'd see as going towards this phase transition. So the question is, how can we still find a way to use this phase transition to induce a strain that will enhance our converse magnetoelectric coupling, right? So the first thought is, okay, let's grow it under strain, right? So if we strain or if we apply a stress to our sample as it's growing, right, and we release it, then as we're applying the stress again during our measurement, we're getting closer to a neutral state so that the magnetization has more uh, flexibility to be able to rotate with respect to the change in the ferroelectric domains. Um, right, and so the question is, okay, so what happens in these films grown under strain compared to those that are only measured under strain, right? Um, yeah, so that's, that's the hypothesis that I just put up there. So for our materials processing, we used uh, sputtering and we um, deposited, we always did two crystals in tandem, um, one without stress and the other in a stress rig when we deposited the films. And we poised it so that we were, um, should be close to the onset of that, that phase, that strain induced phase, or that electric field induced uh, phase transition. Um, and then we did our layer breaking films and we deposited it onto our single crystals under these conditions. Um, this is the stress fixture, just for perspective here. Um, so this is what we used both in growth and in measurements. And because this was going in a vibrating sample magnetometer, all of it is plastic or brass, right? Um, and we used this to go through this growth matrix here, right? So we tried looking at things that were grown without strain and measured without strain things that were grown with strain and measured without strain, and things that were um, grown with strain and measured under strain, right? So those are covering all of, all of your conditions. Um, one of the ways that we used to measure strain was to look at the, let me walk this back. So in addition to the amount of, of stress that's applied by this fixture, there's also a certain amount of stress that comes from just depositing by sputtering in general, right? And so to track that, what we did is we used a freely suspended, very thin piece of silicon, and we looked at um, both E-beam and sputtering, and we looked at um, the curvature that occurred in these silicon wafers due to the deposition conditions. And from that, we could work back using Stoney's formula at how much strain we had from just the deposition alone, which is actually a fair bit. So this plus the amount of um, strain imparted into the film by the stress fixture should be enough to get us very close to where that um, phase transition is. Um, this is a bit more perspective that I think is important to add. So these samples were measured by um, vibrating sample magnetometer, VSM, and we did this as a function of angle. So the idea here is that if you have an easy axis, right, so it's like it sounds, the direction along which it is easiest to orient your, pole, your magnetization, right, you expect to have a high remnant magnetization. Um, it should be very easy to get to saturation. It should take lower fields, right? Um, but it should change as you look um, at different, look at your sample at different angles with respect to the field because you have this combination of magnetocrystalline anisotropy, shape anisotropy, this magnetoelastic contribution. So we wanted to kind of map out what the, um, the magnetic response looks like in multiple dimensions. And what we're looking for here is changes in our remnant magnetization, MR, 
um, making sure that we eventually, for everything, reach the same saturation magnetization, which in this case happened at, at much higher fields for things along hard axis, and our course of field, which is HC here, which is the um, magnetic field needed to switch in a macroscopic sense. Okay, so now that we understand, uh, you know, now that we're all here experts in piezoelectricity, ferroelectricity, multiferroics, magnetoelectrics, artificial heterostructures, and how to deposit all these materials, let's talk about um, the results. So measuring converse magnetoelectric coupling in unstrained um, heterostructures. Um, so these were the, the first set of films, so the unstrained, unstrained samples measured by um, VSM. And we, I, I have them plotted here for a positive and negative field for a series of different angles. And one of the things that you'll notice is that the, um, the degrees are all kept in the same temperature. So the, the legend is the same in both. But the direction at which you hit your, your what we expect to be the easy axis, which is the, the sharpest, squarest, most transition with the highest remnant magnetization, actually changes with the application of electric field. Um, I think it's a little easier to see it here. So at, um, at when we're oriented along zero degrees um, or for negative 400 volts or negative applied electric field, we have our easy axis closer to zero degrees. When we go to uh, positive 400 volts, that switches and it's actually closer to 90 degrees, right? So let's plot all of this up together so we can see it simultaneously. So that's what we have here, right? So um, the black in this case is without any voltage. The blue is for positive and the red is for negative. And you can see that as we're applying voltage, we do get this shift in the direction along which we have our largest remnant magnetization, right? So that is indicating to us that we have this shift in the direction in which we have our easy axis, which is consistent with what we'd expect the piezoelectric response to be doing in these materials, right? So, so that was exciting. I mean. That's how it should work, the standard textbooks. But it was still exciting that we got it in any case, you know. Um, and likewise, you saw the same thing for the change in the course of field. Um, the next step is to use this to calculate the um, converse magnetoelectric coupling. So in a sense, you could just use your piezoelectric coefficient and your piezomagnetic coefficient. But uh, it's not great because, you know, there's losses at the interface. Nothing's ever really ideal. They don't couple effectively all the time. So in this case, um, we just looked at the raw change in the magnetization as a function of the applied electric field. And we looked at, uh, calculated in the difference of the MH loops both with and without electric field. So that's what's shown down here. Um, now the... Um, just because of the nature of the way that the samples were pulled and organized, we typically see a larger response along the positive, neither here nor there. Um, but the largest response that we see is near this course of field, right? So, so here and here for, for these samples. And even for an unstrained film, we're already getting um, eight uh, by minus six second per meter, which compared to what you remember back is actually still pretty large, right? So this is suggesting that um, all of these kind of initial strain um, engineering that we're doing with both the, the layer breaking and this really high piezoelectric crystal just in and of themselves give you a high response, right? Um, but it is not the largest CME, so I should stress that. Okay, so, so now that we have this baseline, we understand what's occurring uh, in the converse magnetoelectric coupling in our, our standard sample without any strain present. So the question is, okay, what happens when we introduce strain either during growth or during measurements, right? So we repeated the whole thing again. In this case, we took MH loops of films that were grown under strain and measured without it, right? And we see that they're pretty consistent with what we saw before. We have a maximum in our remnant magnetization at 90 and a minimum at zero. Um, but the loops look pretty consistent. There's a little bit difference in our, our coercive field, but overall, these are good solid loops, right? Now what's different is the fact that we do not see the same type of, of rotation of our easy axis. In fact, we do not see much change at all with applied electric field um, in these samples. And, and to a certain sense, that makes sense, right? You apply stress to a sample, you grow it, um, and then you release all of that stress and you pull it into tension. So you expect that it should not 
to first order be able to respond as effectively, right? Um, so this is, this is the entire matrix kind of plotted out with these polar plots for all of our response. So what we just talked about over here, you can see uh, what we expect to be a pretty normal or standard rotation of our easy axis. Here with films that were grown under strain, you can see that applying electric field did not do much to change the response that we saw. Um, likewise, applying a certain amount of strain kind of um, did, did the same thing, but, it, but in a different direction for films that were grown without strain, right? Um, but unfortunately, when we look at films that were grown with strain and measured with strain, which we expect to be more freely moving, we see that there actually is not significant changes between fields with and without the amount of applied uh, electric field. And, and this is, again, one of those things like, okay, well, I had this hypothesis and, and it didn't work, right? So at this point, I almost scrapped this project completely. And I was like, okay, well, that didn't work. But I decided to go ahead and to measure the um, converse magnetoelectric coupling for each of these in any case. Um, so what we found is that for the strain-strain samples, we got uh, approximately 9.9 .9 by 10 to the minus 6 second per meter. Um, and this was, this work is impressed now, but, but uh, at the time, it was the largest non-resonant room temperature converse magnetoelectric coupling. Um, now, it, there's other work that, infer, uh, that you can extrapolate from that, that suggests that there are higher CMEs. Um, and it doesn't sound as great to say this is the largest directly measured non-resonant room temperature. It, you know, it gets too long. Um, but in any case, we see that we have this very large, uh, oh, sorry, very large spike that's, that's occurring in these films so that our instantaneous values are over one, uh, one by five, one by minus five. Um, and if we, again, kind of plot this all out, this is uh, just kind of a, a snapshot of all of the alpha CME for both directions in all of our films. We can again see that we do not see very much response when we're trying to drive these samples um, into a strain state close to this phase transition. But when we're using um, strain during growth and then driving it um, with strain during the measurements, we can see that we actually have a, a, this very high and very much narrowed kind of um, CME response, right? And uh, yeah, so this is, this is a, a snapshot of all of the um, maximum values for each one of the different conditions that we looked at and the angle at which it occurred. Um, and I also want to highlight this really quickly here is that there was this, this is the magnetic field that it took to get to the maximum in the, um, in the CME. And you can see that there's actually a really significant change in these as well. And this, um, this I thought was particularly interesting. So the question is, why is the converse magnetoelectric coupling larger in samples that do not show any apparent rotation in the easy axis? So to, to address this, we went back and looked at the image loops themselves. So an unstrained, unstrained film is here on the left. And you can see that there is, like we talked about before, something that indicates that we have this change in the direction of the axis along which it's easiest to rotate our magnetization. Now, when we look at films that were grown under strain and measured under strain, we do not see this. There is effectively no significant change in the remnant magnetization between the um, between loops with and without applied electric field. What there is instead is a difference in the coercive field. So in a sense, how easy it is or the energy it takes to switch your magnetic domains from one direction to another. Now, the, what's interesting is because this maintains such a square loop, if you were to put the sample here, there is a, or if you were to poise the sample here and drive it with a slightly larger magnetic field or with an electric field, there's a large change that you get in your magnetization. Right, because you kind of fall off that edge. So in this case, what we're showing is that there's clearly a change in mechanisms that occur um, going from films without strain to those with strain. So, um, and yeah, got it. Um, yeah, so in, in future work, I think the next steps are to kind of understand or dig deeper into these course of field changes to use what we know about um, ferroelectric domain characterization, right? So here and this guy to go through and uh, to use that to, to kind of build up our understanding of the magnetic domain structure changes as well and how they correlate to the changes in our ferroelectric domain structure changing as we're going through this, right? 
Um, the other thing that I didn't touch on too much is the, the imprint that we see in our image loops suggests that there's a different type of exchange than we'd expect between our layers. And then finally, you know, kind of optimizing both the piezoelectric and the magnetostrictive response with these idealized materials to see if we could push this response even further. Um, so with that, I'll say that we have designed these artificial multiferric header structures. We use multiple different strain engineering approaches. We found that for films grown during, uh, with strain and measured with strain that we had this increased converse magnetoelectric effect and identified this kind of shift that's occurring in the, in the mechanisms that led to this, which we need to dig into deeper. Um, so with that, I will say thank you and uh, leave my email up here if you have any questions. We have time for questions here, if anybody has anything. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I don't know that I heard you explain how you were imparting the strain, and I was wondering, was that due to temperature or lattice mismatch? No, 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 like, so we're, wait for it, two seconds. So we are putting, when we are growing, we put the, the crystal, the substrate that we're using in this stress fixture, and we crank it down and impart a certain amount of stress and measure that. And then we clean the surfaces and put that stress fixture in the sputter system. Okay. So it, it, so yeah, so we're, and, and we use the same fixture both for, for the growth and for the measurements once cleaned. Yeah, my question was on your plot of the remnant magnetization, the radar plots, the, the first one, which I guess was the unstrained, unstrained, yeah. showed less rotation for positive polarity than negative polarity. Is that asymmetry expected, and, and what does it mean? Yeah, so that that is expected. So um, the nature of the cut of these crystals and their polling typically means that we usually have a certain amount of, of asymmetry that we'd expect. and I. Uh, believe that that's the majority, the uh, majority of the cause that's leading to that um, is just that you have it easier to, to change your um, domain orientation in one way just because of the defects that are present in the ferroelectric that pin things in certain ways. Any other questions? Hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, I assume that you carry out all your experiments at room temperature. How does this effect um, um, behave um, in, on a temperature temperature scale? I mean, uh, uh, how far in temperature can you expect to to see these effects? Um, that's a that's a fair question. So, um, as far as the the piezoelectric material goes, we are actually pretty close to um, a temperature. You know, you could, you could drive this phase transition through a number of different ways, and one of them is with temperature. So you're not going to be able to take this to hundreds of degrees because you would have already driven through that phase transition with temperature. So that's, that's one of the downsides that people are working with with the relaxer ferroelectrics is their transition temperatures. And you can change the, the composition of those and drive it um, to higher temperatures, but it would take a different material with a, with a different composition and, and uh, optimization as far as where the rhombohedral or orthorhombic transition goes. Um, cooling it down would, would take you a little bit further away from that kind of instability, so I imagine it would take a little bit more field in both senses to drive it through, but it would, it would certainly be stable, more stable, I think, at lower temperatures than at higher temperatures. Yeah. Anything else? Okay, if not, let's uh, thank Warren one more time. Okay.